isn't it good that we get to talk and walk with the one who made everything, who healed everything, made the oceans, made everything else. Praise the Lord for that. It is difficult to see everyone with masks on. It's, I was here on Wednesday night and it was very strange seeing hardly any faces, just eyes peering at me. Very difficult. Did you get that, Brother Gideon, on Wednesday? It was, it was a bit difficult. All right, we're going to start in the book of Luke chapter 9, if we can. Thank you, David, for reading uh, Luke chapter 5. We appreciate that. We're going to start in Luke 9. I'm going to read one verse. We'll be looking in Luke a bit today. I'm going to read one verse, verse 23. The Bible says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help me this morning and ask the Lord to give you what you need to hear this morning as well. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for this church, thankful that we are able to meet right even today, even though we have to wear masks and things are a bit uh, maybe uncomfortable or a little bit different, I appreciate that we still get to meet. Thank you that we can that we can have a look in your word and hear it and be encouraged by it and be taught by it. And I pray that you would use your word this morning to speak to the hearts that are here and the hearts that, that may be looking online. Lord, you know everyone where they're at, you know all circumstances, you know all um, areas of life people are in at the moment. And I just pray that you would use your word in, in, in whatever way that you see fit. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, we heard the sad news of the passing of Brother Gilbert Anger. Most of us have met him or know him. He went home to be with the Lord. Um, he was a man of great influence in a lot of people. Believe it or not, he was a great influence in, in my life. Um, I'd known him for many years, and I think one of the last times I think I remember seeing him was here, here at Good Shepherd, and I know he talked a lot about missions and really tried to encourage people and stir people up. I remember I think it was one afternoon in between either sessions or between church, um, he opened it up for people to come and to be invited to talk about how you can uh, develop things for missions and even encourage people how you can actually earn an income to help yourself get on, uh, to provide income for yourself while you're on the field. So he really, really tried hard to stir people up about missions. He had a passion to inspire us to move us out of our comfort zone. He talked about that. A lot of people would like being in the comfort zone and he challenged people to move out of that comfort zone. He led by example because he personally went to places often no one else would. Where there was a missionary maybe there, he would go and encourage and, and help and teach and have camps and he would go to far out, far out places that we probably wouldn't even endeavour to think about going to. He revealed the needs of others to us when he presented the work that he was doing about people who were dying without Christ and sought to give what he could to meet, obviously, um, the need in that world. Was he a challenge to you? He was, certainly was to me. Brother Gilbert is a classic example of someone, I believe, who uh, is, is a Luke 9.23 person. He was someone who, who would take up his cross daily and followed Christ. Now Jesus in his earthly ministry had that same passion. He wanted to see everybody saved and he actually sought out others to get on board with getting the gospel out to a lost world. When he preached, he invited people to come and as we look at this morning, he, he went to people and said, I want you to come along of the journey with me. His desire has never changed and he is still looking for men and women today who will take up their cross daily and follow him. When I was reading in the book of Matthew just recently, this is where this thought come from, Matthew chapter 4. I did mark that there. I want to read some verses similar to Luke chapter 5. And this is what got me thinking about this. As I was reading from verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting an net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So this is what I was reading, and 
This next verse just jumped out at me and got me started to, and, and got me thinking about this thought. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. They straightway left their nets and followed him. And as we read on verse 21 and 22, and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, his father, mending the nets. And he called them. And guess what? And they immediately left the ship with their fa- and their father and followed him. We see Jesus encouraging others to come on the journey. I want to note just some simple thoughts about this particular meeting with these men. Jesus investigated, Jesus investigated for everyday men to follow him. He didn't go looking for the most educated. He didn't think, I wonder who I can get. Maybe if I chose the most wealthy man, that might be a good addition to my ministry. Maybe he thought, I'll look for someone I know who can speak well. Someone I've maybe, in my travels, I've noticed who seems to be a leader within the community. I'll choose them. But he never did that. Seems like his investigations came and brought him to people every, who were everyday men. These men were just workers. They were fishermen. And I believe today Jesus still looks for everyday people. He doesn't just purposely look for those who have the money or those who, who are the most educated. Some of the greatest preachers are those who, who never finished school. They were never the most wealthy. They didn't come from influential families. They were everyday men. And Jesus still looks for everyday people. You know what the good news about that is? He can use you. Because you people here, and myself included, we're just everyday people. There's nothing special about me. Uh, there's, and it's not a, a criticism or a negative. There's nothing special about you. You're just everyday people. You're Australians. You're in Albany Creek today. God can use you. I noticed in this, in Matthew 4 and also in Luke 5, that Jesus interrupted the busyness of their life. They were mending nets. They were fishing. They were doing their everyday jobs. It was like Jesus come to the workplace and said, I want you. And it's like Jesus today still comes to you where you're at in life, whether you're fixing something electrical, whether you're digging a ditch, whether you're in a retail outlet, whether you're helping someone, Jesus will come to you just where you're at and say, I want you. Get on board. Come and help me. Jesus is looking for just everyday people in the busyness of their life. In, in Luke 5, where, where Brother Dave read for us this morning, a similar passage, and in this particular instance, Jesus interacted greatly in their current lives. Jesus actually blessed them with an abundance of fish. Jesus says in, in verse 4 of Luke 5, he said, when he said, uh, let, when, sorry, now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a, a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had, done this, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets break. Wow. God has now interacted in their lives. He's, he's come looking. He's interrupted now. He's interacting with them. And he starts to bless them greatly with an abundance of fish. Can you imagine in your life, in your workplace, in your business, if, 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 if you had just gained a great windfall, a massive contract that you've never seen before, or maybe a, maybe a promotion in your business, and you're thinking, wow, this is amazing. And then Jesus then instigated a discomforting challenge. After that's just taken place, after he's just given them something that they've probably never seen for such a long time, he now says, come, follow me. And we'll look at that point in just a minute, a little bit more. They now faced a difficult inward battle because they had seen their, their fishing business now explode. And again, we'll address this in just a, minute, just a moment. But now they were offered a new vocation, not just, not just fishers of fish, but fishers of men. I'm glad in Matthew 4, when I read that, it talks about, the, 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 it uses the words straightway and immediately. They left their nets and their business and they followed Jesus. Now, this is the focal point of my thought today. They had to let go of their nets 
to follow Christ. That was the thought that jumped out at me when I was reading Matthew 4. What if they hadn't let go of the nets? What if they had seen the blessings of Jesus and said, you beauty, follow you. Well, you've just started something in me, right? Why would I do that? But they followed Christ. Some nets in themselves may not be a bad thing, but they can become a snare. The very thing that stifles blessings that God would like to bestow upon us. You know, too many people become ensnared by the, by the familiarity of this life, the need to possess more and more. They want to better themselves and the desire to make it in life. I wonder what net you might have that's holding you back. I wonder what net it is that will stop you from serving Christ fully. I wonder when Jesus says to you, come follow me, I wonder what the first thing in your mind that pops into your mind that says, that would mean I'd have to, I'm not sure if I can because of, that's a net. And that's what I want to have a look at this morning. So the first net, or some examples of net, or reasons why people won't let go, is the net of possibility. I've kind of alluded to this so far in Luke chapter 5. I want you to think about this. These disciples, when Jesus came, according to Luke chapter 5, Jesus gave them a great massive amount of fish. So much that the Bible says that their nets began to break. Can you imagine having something in your life come so greatly that it's so overwhelming to you that you can't believe that it's happened to you? And this is the kind of thing that I kind of think when I put myself in this position, when I, when I try to think I'm there at, on that day, when Jesus says, let down your nets, and, and they've gone and said, well, listen, we've already done it all night. There's no fish today. Who's ever been out fishing and the fish just aren't biting? Pretty much me every time I go, all right? Except that video that Pete's got on his phone, hopefully it's, it's gone. Oh, that's another in joke, don't worry about that. But, um, when you go out fishing and you don't catch anything, obviously you don't want to stay out there. You don't want to go back out when someone says, you, you, you imagine you've spent hours out fishing, you get home and your neighbour says, hey, you want to go fishing? There's nothing out there. And Jesus says, please just do it. And they do. And the Bible describes an event that takes place that they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in verse 6, says that then, and their net break. And then it says, and they beckoned on their partners which were in the other ship, and they, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Can you imagine that? Dave, going out in your boat, and you catch so many fish that you begin to sink. Man, you'd be rejoicing. You're like, woo. You, not only did the nets break, but their, their ships began to sink. Wow. The net of possibility. These men, as I mentioned, faced this enormous thought Look what's just happened. Can you imagine if this happened regularly with, with, with this Jesus' blessing? Or if Jesus can do that, we want him to be part of our fishing business. Can you imagine the possibilities? If this happens now, imagine what can happen in the future. The net of possibility for some people ensnare us from serving the Lord. The possibility of success. I think it's within us all to want to be successful. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful. I think God gives us that, that ability to want to achieve, to want to, to want to do something more. But when it becomes such where when Jesus comes by and says, I want you to follow me, sometimes that net of possibility, well, that's where I think, but then I'll have to stop my business. It's going so well right now. I've just been given this promotion. That means I may have to move. I can't do that. But what, what if? What if this or what if that? What net of possibility is stopping you? I only know some of you and, and what you do for work and, and where you're at in life. But the possibility of success can, can stifle us from serving the Lord. What about the possibility of satisfaction, the feeling of achieving something great? That's something I've always wanted to do, it's just been in there within my heart. A satisfaction of doing something I didn't think I could do. 
maybe being born with Tourette syndrome and, and, and having a very bad stutter as a child. Maybe the desire to want to overcome that, the desire to do something that I never thought I could do. You know, at the age of 12, I couldn't, I couldn't talk on the telephone. I wouldn't talk on the telephone because my stutter was that bad. I, I wouldn't walk into a shop. I definitely wouldn't stand in front of a church because I was just fearful that people wouldn't allow me or wouldn't wait for me to get out what I wanted to say. I felt so self-conscious. And the more I think about it, it's probably why that desire is there. It's because I want to be satisfied that I can do something that either I didn't think I could do or I, maybe people says I can't do the feeling to want to achieve something great. And sometimes even that can be a net of possibility. It can be a distraction. It can be something that stops us when Jesus says, come follow me. What about the possibility of safety? We all want to make sure our families are provided for. God says we should do that. But sometimes even that, if God says, come follow me, and God convicts the heart that we need to do a, a specific thing, a specific purpose, and we realise that safety net of our business, our job, our income, even our church, if we do this, then that might have to go and stop. And sometimes that can be a net of, a net of safety, and the possibility of safety, something I, that I can trust and rely upon. As long as I've got my superannuation there, I'll be fine. As long as I've got that investment and it doesn't fail, oh, I'm, I'm safe. I can trust that. But when Jesus says, come follow me, he's really saying totally and wholly trust me as we go on this journey. And that's what these, these guys had to do. They had to say, what are we going to do for a living? I'm sure that went through their head. I know it just says instantly, immediately, straightway. But I'm sure there were instant thoughts of, what does this mean? They were, they were human beings, they, weren't any, they were just everyday guys. If I do this, what's it going to mean for my business, my dad, my family? What does that mean? So the net of possibility can be a snare, can be something that stops us from serving the Lord. Our possibility needs to fall in, into the possibility of Christ, seeing as all things are possible with him. The second one is the net of is the net of pride, is the net of pride. Think about in Luke 15, we think about the story of the prodigal son. I won't read all of that, we know the story. But just for time's sake, I'll explain what I want to do. The net of pride. Think about when the young man decided to leave his, his, his father's care and his, his father's home and, and the things that his father could give him. He says, Dad, give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. I want to go. I want to leave. And the Bible describes that his dad gives him his, in, his inheritance. And I want you to notice something that I bet you he felt pretty good. When we get a, a chunk of money, something happens inside us. We actually feel pretty good. If you've ever got a, a bonus or a, maybe a tax refund or something where it's something you don't normally have, you actually feel a little bit good inside. I'm actually feeling pretty good. That's that pride. Pride seems to puff us up in the immediate. I reckon the lad, the, the guy, I reckon he thought he was the king of the world. I've got this money, I'm free. I can do what I want, and he goes and does that. The Bible describes that this man goes and wastes his money on riotous living. He wastes it all. It doesn't say how long it, it, it takes, but the Bible says he wastes what his dad has given him. So he's filled with pride. He goes out and does this, and then he comes to a point where his money runs out, and now he finds himself in a bit of a situation where he doesn't know what to do. And he goes and seeks some work and finally finds a job with a citizen of that country where, where he travelled to. And he finds himself feeding pigs. Something that he probably never imagined he would do. And in this, I think pride pretends everything is good on the outside. You know, he never went, he, he didn't go home straight away to his dad. He went looking and he, I think he thought, well, I'll be able to handle this. I'll be able to deal with this. I'll just get a job. And he looks and he looks 
And all on the outside, he's probably portraying this, this facade that everything is okay. I know deep down I'm in deep trouble, but pride kind of tells everyone that everything's good on the outside. And I wonder if that can be some of us today. Pride pretends that everything is good on the outside, he, and then he had to trust the citizen of that country. But you know what happens in this story? Before he can actually do anything, and this is where this letting go of the net comes in, it wasn't until he made a decision that he had to let that pride go. And you know what happens when we get in that position where, where things are not going well because of our own stubbornness and pride? Pride seems to punish us on the inside. While he was feeding those pigs and eating the pig food, I'm sure in the back of his mind he was thinking, what have I done? Why am I in this situation? How do I get out of this? And it's kind of like a self-condemnation. And until he lets go of that pride, until he lets go of that net of pride and says, I know what I'll do. I remember my, my dad's servants, they've got plenty to eat. And I've already ruined my relationship with my dad, but maybe if I go back and humble myself and I'll just become a servant, at least I'll be able to have something to live for. Until he let that go, and when he did, he found the ability to go on. And I wonder if the net of pride today stops some from going and following Christ. Me? Go to a third world country? Surely not. Surely not me. God knows I'm better suited here. God knows my skills, and this is the outward appearance, God knows my skills and the amount of money I can bring into church here and that will be better suited. Let alone inwardly we're barren. Inwardly we're, we're crying out for help. That net of pride is something that can stop us from serving the Lord. I wonder, I wonder if the net of prosperity whether, whether the net of, of our possibility holds you back, whether the net of pride holds you back. What about the net of procrastination? The net of procrastination. In Luke chapter 9, we read a familiar passage that I know you're very, very familiar with. Luke 9 verse 57 to 62 the Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said, un Jesus said unto him, let the, dead bury the let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In these, in these, uh, um, in these six verses, I want, to, I want to look at two different thoughts of procrastination. Firstly, in the first part of these, of these verses is the fact that lifestyle can be too important to us. Lifestyle is too important. When, when Jesus told this man, he says, listen, foxes have, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. It was like Jesus said, hey, listen, you follow me, you, you may not have a lot. You may not have what you've got now. And I think we've kind, of, we've kind of covered this a little bit. But sometimes to follow Christ might mean we don't have what we have now. We may have to give something up. We may have to make that decision. It's not about what I've got now. It's about what I can do for Christ. And sometimes that, that, those things that we have have such a hold on us that we keep saying, maybe, we, maybe if my job fails, then I'll look at serving. Procrastination, I, I, I can do it at a later date. Have you ever heard people say, when my children are grown up, then I'll serve the Lord on the field? When, when I get to a certain level of income, then I can self, 
Um, I can be self-sufficient and I can pay for my own way on the mission field. But until then, I really can't do it. For a lot of people, they, you, you find reasons to procrastinate. Maybe my health isn't very good right now. I just don't have the education I've got. I need more education first. I need more skills. I need to get married first. I need to do this first. We can always come up with an excuse or a reason why we can't serve the Lord now because we're procrastinators. There's always a reason why we can't. There's always another excuse why we can't. That's what I get out of that verse. And then the second part of, of procrastination in the other two men that come by, a lifestyle firstly was, is too important to us, but then loved ones can come first. Loved ones come first. Family is often the thing that stops us serving. What will my family say? Thinking I am left my job to serve the Lord, they're going to think I'm crazy, I'm stupid. Why would anybody do that? You had a great career. You were working your way up the corporate ladder. You had life made. You had the income, you had the retirement plan, and you've given all that away. Are you crazy? I remember when I was in Bible college, one of the lecturers, um, I can't even remember his name now, but he, uh, I remember the thing that, that stood out was he was a successful motor mechanic and he worked on racing cars. Had a great business, had things set out and he was earning a lot of money because of this, this uh, obviously the racing industry makes a lot of money, a lot of corporate sponsors. And he worked on the cars. He was like the head mechanic. He was a Christian. And God called him to, to serve the Lord full time. He said he struggled with it, realising that he had to give up something. And finally he made the decision to, to stop that and to serve God full time. And I remember him saying his family just thought he was crazy. Why would you do that? There's so much money, so much opportunity, so much that you've got going for you and you give it up to do this thing for a church, this religious thing? Wow. Family often play a big part. What about the young man who wants to serve the Lord and, and mum says, you can't go there. You'll have to stay here. You can't go to a foreign land, you have to stay. We've got things set out for you. Come into the family business, come and do this, come and do that. Loved ones often stop us from serving the Lord. They, they, they become first thing in our lives. So we've talked about the net of possibility, the net of pride, the net of procrastination. What about the net of pessimism? What about those who are just negative on everything? There are people even today, seem to be a group, I call it a group of narrow-minded people who always are negative on anything that, that can be done for the Lord. I'm brought into mind how Jesus often had to correct the disciples about their incorrect thinking about people who were coming to see him. People came and they were saying, oh, leave Jesus alone. Negative. You don't need to see him. And Jesus would say, hey, let them come. Let them come. Send them away, Jesus. We can't feed them. No. Let's sit them down. Let's feed them. Sometimes people, people can be negative. You say, I'm, I've been praying about doing this ministry. And people look at you and think, surely someone else can do that, not, not you. You can't be the one that's going to do that. You're not educated enough. You don't have enough skills to do that. Wouldn't brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so be better to do that? There's always going to be people who are negative those without who, who, who weigh on us, who tell us we're not good enough, that surely God would choose somebody else. There's always people that will do that. Always. I remember the thought just coming to my mind then. I, I've, I've shared this before. When I was in Sydney, just going through Bible college and opportunity to preach, and I got to preach in the church and... I was preaching on, on Daniel in the lion's den. And I'm a lot younger than I am now and uh, try to be a bit more animated and 
reading through and, and preaching through. And another brother who was going through Bible college too, he came up to me after the service and he says, well, that was a good message for Sunday school. And it was just like, the reason why I say that is just like a negative, a pessimist, someone who, very negative and, and, and come from outside and those things can make us think, well, maybe I just won't serve the Lord. Maybe I'm not good enough. And this, that's the second thing, is the net of pessimism can come from within. And this is, I guess, maybe um, for me, sometimes we find the negatives within ourselves and find reasons why we can't do anything for God. I'm just not that good. I'm, you tell yourself you're not that educated. I stutter still from time to time. I get stuck on things. I don't have the oratorial school skills as other people. I don't feel confident. I don't think I've got the value that people might want. I struggle with that. It goes through my mind regularly. Whenever I've ever, ever thought about pastoring, I've often quickly dismissed it because I can't do that. I can never do that. I can't. People make me struggle. If you're a pastor, you've got to deal with people. But I can identify with this part, that, that the net of pessimism, that can stop me from serving God. Think about Moses. I, I thought about Moses, how he said to the Lord, he says, I'm not eloquent. And he said that he was slow of speech and, and of slow tongue. Moses was the same. He didn't think he could do anything. He didn't think he could do what, what God wanted. And it nearly became a net that, that stopped him from doing what God wanted him to do. Now, you might be sitting here this morning thinking the same thing. Well, I've never spoken before. I've never studied before much about the Bible like that. But let me testify that with God, God can help you do it. From someone in, from my background, from where I come from, if God can help me stand here this morning, God can definitely help you, who, from my thinking, may have even had a better start in life than what I ever did. So the net of pessimism. One I thought about this morning, and I'll just mention this in passing, but, and I think, I, I don't know why God brought this to mind today, but the net of past hurts. The net of past hurts. As people, often the hurts of the past get in the way of us moving forward. Have you ever had that? Sometimes it's people who, who actually hurt us, and sometimes people will, will get up and they'll leave church because they've been hurt. Somebody said something and they can't get past it, and that becomes a wall or a net that ensnares them from serving God. Someone gets offended here at church and they step down from a ministry or they, or they move to the other side of the church, and that it becomes a, something that ensnares them, past hurts. I've been hurt here at church. You know, there have been times someone said something and I've taken great offence and I've thought, but guess what? It's not going to stop me from serving the Lord and it shouldn't stop you from serving the Lord. If there's something that has been a barrier there that I just can't get past, that's a net that is stopping you from serving the Lord. The net of past hurts. Very real in people's lives today. You can't let that control you. And the last one is the net of persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. I'll find it in my Bible now. The Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. You know why some people don't follow Christ when they're asked to? Because they have fear of persecution. If I do that, I may get myself in trouble. Or, uh, for example, I'll use, a, I'll, I'll use a personal example. India. I'm sure, Pastor, you'll be able to testify with this. When you 
when you go to a place where you know you're not wanted, where you know the law is very uh, against what you have to say, the net of persecution becomes a very great real fear in your mind. You start to rationalise what I can and what I can't do. And it's obviously wise to be, you need to, obviously you need to be wise. But the, that, that fear becomes very real, even to the point that for, for some, well, I'm not, I just can't do it, I can't risk it. What if my family get hurt? What if I get put in jail? What if I get injured? What if I get killed? The, the, the threat of persecution becomes a very real deterrent to follow Christ. Now that's in the, in the mission side of things, but what if, what if I tell people around here today and I get, em- it's gonna sound very silly, what, what if I get embarrassed because they laugh at me? Now I say that in, in tongue in cheek, but in reality that is the truth sometimes. We are fearful about what people think of us, even in our own community, because we, we don't like to feel uh, or we don't like that confrontation or, or that or people thinking bad of us or thinking negative of, of us and it can be so crippling that we just don't open our mouth anymore. We don't tell people about Jesus because what if they don't like what I've got to say? And it's a real thing. It can be a real thing where it, where it, it uh, the net of persecution, it, it propagates fear to the well-intended. It puts fear in you. But you know what it also does? It paralyzes faith. It paralyzes you in your walk with God. It, it, it keeps your eyes on sight on those around us instead of the one that's within us and what he can do. And then if we allow this net to continue, what it does is it, it, um, the net of persecution, it precedes failure. If we allow that to ensnare us, we will never fulfill our potential for God. Every one of us here has a potential that God wants to use. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, no whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're a man, woman, boy or girl, God has, a, um, God has the ability to use you. There is potential that God wants to use. And God, remember we go all the way, all the way back to the beginning, God will come to where you are at the time of life where you are in the everyday person, in the busyness of their life, doing what they do every day and God will come and say, I want you to follow me. I want to use you. Will you let me? Can you imagine what it would have been like for the, for, um, the guys in Luke 9 when Jesus said, and, and, and Matthew 4, when he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men and they went, Nah. Things are going good now. You've just helped us. Thank you so much, Jesus. But listen, we can't leave this now. They could even rationalise it just like we would. But what would God think? God's just blessing, and you want me to throw it all away? That can't be right. Why would God bless me this way? He wouldn't want me to throw it away. He wouldn't want me to change direction. This must be the course I'm supposed to be on. Can you imagine if the disciples said, no, sorry. Can you imagine what God must have thought? Come, I've got something for you. I've just shown you what I can do. No. And I wonder how many people are in that boat this morning in, on the seashore to, today where Jesus says, I've been trying to get your attention. I've been showing you how great I am. I've been revealing things to you And I've even said, come, follow me. But you keep saying, no, there's too many things that are stopping us. You are too ensnared by too many nets. And we could have multiple nets just wrapped around us and we we can't break free because we've got dozens of nets, all starting with P. All starting with P. Paul, I could be in that so many things that are stopping us serving God that we need God to reveal what they are. And then we need to be brave enough to say, God, 
if this is a net, obviously if it's got to be God shows you that, that that's the problem, then we need to say, God, I'll let that go. And I'm not saying we all quit our jobs today, but if, if for some of us, where that might be a snare or a net for us, then we need to be willing to say, if that's what you're telling me, God, then I'm willing to let that net go. Straightway. Immediately. Now notice, in the passage, Jesus didn't say, just let it go and see you later. He says, let that go and I will make you to do something else. I will make you fishers of men. I will change. You're still going to be active. You're still going to be busy. But you're going to do what I want. You're going to, doing, you're going to be doing my will now and not just what your will is. So if you let go of the net, expect God will then take you and put you to work. And God's already proven that he can fill two ships. He can explode your wealth if he so desires. He's already proven he can do it. He can make you promote to any sort of position in anything. He's already proven that he can do that. He's proven he can provide even when you have fished all night. He can make that happen. Even when you're so fearful of what's going to happen, God says, oh, I can do it. I can, I'm proving it to you now. Paul, you've had Tourette's syndrome. You've stuttered. I've shown you what I can do through you. Let go. Follow me. And what will you follow the Lord in this morning? I'm going to ask... Um, John and Lisa to come and play again. We're going to sing I Surrender All one more time as a closing song before Andrew comes and closes. What I invite you is if God's used any peanuts or anything else that, that he may have spoken to you about, I'd encourage you to take the time to talk to God. It would be interesting to have a letting go of the net service one day where we get together and we say, God, I'll let this go. And it's like back in the 80s where they had the, the CD burnings and the, and the record burning nights at church. We got rid of all the rock music and wouldn't be good to have a service where we say, God, I know these things are holding me back. I want to let go. I don't want to let them hold me back anymore. And realistically, it's only you that will know what the net is, if there's any. Maybe you're totally surrendered, and that's, hey, I'm, I praise the Lord for that. May God use you abundantly even more than he's even using you now. But if there's anything holding you back, I encourage you to let it go and start serving the Lord. Amen.